Pod Studios. This is Talkin' Rock. Talkin' Rock. Your backstage pass to some of your favorite rock artists. Here's your host, Meltdown. It's another two for the price of one today on Talking Rock. Gavin Rosdale coming up here in uh, just a bit. Got a few minutes with him earlier today. Talked about a lot of things. We'll tell you about that coming up here in a few. Of course, uh, Gavin and Bush have a tour coming out uh, this coming summer. But first, it's uh, David Ellison. Uh, I can't even go through the list of bands that David's <laughs> in right now. After leaving Megadeth, it's just like opened up the floodgates. Uh, we talk about Metal Allegiance. We talk about him seeing Metallica here in Detroit, the Nick Menza documentary, and tons more as we were just scratching the surface. And uh, you can watch this video as well, as uh, Dave is so good about doing the uh, Zoom calls with uh, all of his interviews. But he had this cool shirt on. Well, I guess cool, I'm not in parentheses, air quotes. And that's how we start the uh, conversation off today with David Ellison on Talking Rock. I love the Yachtly Cruise shirt. I haven't seen that band yet. Have you seen them? Dude, they're freaking awesome. I saw them uh, New Year's Eve. They played here in town. And uh, obviously very age-appropriate music. <laughs> and, uh, and I love them, man. They're like the Steel Panther of Yacht Rock, you know? They're like super cool. They look the part. They play great. And, um, yeah, it's, it's funny, you know, cause my son turned me on to yacht rock some years back, you know, of course. And, you know, like for, you know, I don't know about you and me, but growing up in the Midwest, you know, I was listening to AM radio stations on the farm, vocationally FM over in like Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And it was basically yacht rock interrupted by maybe a kiss song, right? Sticks, sweets, you know, something, you know, and I go, I like the heavier stuff, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to some hollow notes and some Christopher cross until I can hear shout it out loud again. There you, know? you go. Yeah. We'll talk about kiss coming up here in a little bit, but first you, you have like a million things going on, by the way, uh, last time I saw you, you're celebrating your birthday here in Detroit with, uh, with Metallica. So, I mean, uh, obviously that made a little bit of news. I saw it all over the place, but that was sure. a great Man, what better? Who better friends to spend your your birthday with than Metallica? <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and Pantera and Five Finger Death Punch and you know the whole gang, Wolfgang and everybody. So uh, yeah, no, that was that was super fun. You, well, it's, it's funny because I was in town, really in the area to film uh, this movie with Drew Fortier, who I play in the Lucid with. We did this new movie called Bunker Heights. And so I had to come in and film my my thug scene for the movie. So uh, it, it worked out perfectly that they were wrapping their their year in Michigan. And obviously we got to hang out and, um, you know, take in a take in a rock concert. Now, did you see Vinny uh, from the band The Lucid when you were here? Vinny from Spun? I didn't. I, no, I didn't. I, I didn't. No, I did the show and then I booked on down the road and uh, finished all the filming and stuff. Uh you know, uh, we you know, down, you know, it, it basically in the area there, but outside outside of Detroit. So, yeah, no, I didn't. Um, you know, Vinny's always busy as well. You know, it's funny. That's one of the reasons people ask, him, when is the Lucid playing? And, you know, it, it's it's just hard with schedules. You know, Mike Heller plays in uh, – Raven, uh, I guess kind of formally maybe Fear Factory. I don't even know if that's a thing anymore. But um, but so he's busy. You know, Vinny's always out with Sponge constantly. And, uh, of course, he brought, you know, some insane clown posse plug <laughs> into the Lucid, you know. So, and that was all Vinny, man, because, you know, he's he's just that kind of fun rock and roll character to come up with fun ideas, you know. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, I, I was just thinking about that as you were talking. I don't know who's in more projects, you or Vinny, because you're in about 27 and he's in about 20 or so. So, you know, I always I always get crap from my manager, from Kings of Thrash. You know, he's he's like, you guys, you, you've ruined rock and roll. You're in too many bands. I said, listen, dude, I, I, I rolled the big rock up the big hill for 20 years exclusively. I mean. There it is, right? right, right, right. <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, and then one day that came to an end and uh, 2002. So, you know, the 2000s was sort of my my that was my decade to be entrepreneurial, um, to be resourceful. <laughs> um, I remember I was talking to some people at Fender and, and one of the ladies over there, she goes, you know, you're very resourceful. And I thought, you know, that what a compliment, you know, to to have that, you know, and, and again, growing up in the Midwest, by the way, I love your your window. That's exactly what it looked like in the farm where I was growing up. Yeah. You know, you learn to be resourceful, man. And, and you know, rock and roll, being in bands has always been an entrepreneurial game, you know. And, and if you're fortunate that, you know, one of these things hits like that, you know, that's 
you're it's a diamond in a rough it's a it's a lottery win if there ever was one but again i've been in a gazillion bands of of various successes and you know not all of them get you golden platinums in fact you know it's funny i just got I just got these metal allegiance ones and now they do streams right they do spotify streams instead of you know like records sold and all that kind of stuff but a plaque is a plaque and it'll look good next to all the rest of them you know that's right. So Metal Allegiance, you got the 10 year anniversary of that coming up at the House of Blues on January 25th. And it's going to be a plethora of guests. Is that what's going to happen? Pretty much. I mean, you know, that thing started on the Motorhead's motorboat cruise. Megadeth was supposed to be on that and then Megadeth canceled it. And so the promoter was a friend of mine and uh, he worked with Shiprock and a bunch of stuff as well. And so, you know, he he called me freaking out, <laughs> like, who's, who's going to be his headliner, you know? And and so I said, you know, dude, I, I got an idea on something. Uh, and I called Mark Mengi, who's my partner, you know, in, in Metal Legions. And because we, you know, he ran artist relations for Harky. And so when I went back to Megadeth, it's funny, Tim Ripper Owens had just introduced me to, to Mark at a NAMM show in 2010. And then literally about, two weeks later, I'm back in Megadeth, you know, and, uh, and I, so I call Mark and go, dude, I need some Harky gear for, you know, we're playing rust and peace. I need it to look and sound authentic, you know, the Jackson bass Harky amp and this stuff. So that was where me and Mengi connected. And then when we started doing the big four shows, Mark put together something that he called metal masters, which was kind of a clinic that then turned into a performance. Right. And it was initially, it was me, Frank Bello on bass, Frank singing, Charlie Benante on guitar, and Mike Portnoy on drums. And we did we did one at a Sam Ash music store over in Cerritos uh, right before the Indio uh, Big Four that we did in, in uh, April 2011. And then and that got some legs, and it, it turned into a thing. You know, then it turned in, you know, Phil Anselmo and Kerry King and Geezer Butler and Dave Lombardo. You know, it was kind of everybody. It was, it was a big thing. And... As Mengi transitioned out of his artist relations gig at uh, at Harkey and Sampson um, that summer of 2014, um, you know, we were chatting and uh, and I just said, man, let's let's keep this going. This is too fun. You know, we got all the famous guys here, you know, so he, he trademarked and rebranded it as Metal Allegiance. And, and then and then the Megadeth, you know, cancellation happened on Motorboat. And I called Mark and go, guess what, buddy? We're up. This is it, you know. Because we had planned on launching it at NAMM in 2015. And, and like a lot of things in life, suddenly the call comes and it's like, dude, this is you. You're, are, you, are you in or not? You know, and, and uh, I remember Billy Sheehan told me that when I was writing my first book. He said, he goes, you'll have to make some of the most critical decisions under the worst of circumstances or, you know, the, the least convenience kind of duress. And this was, you know, this wasn't duress, but it was like, hey, Mark, remember that thing we were talking about last week, Metal Legions? Well, guess what? We're going to be on the motorboat. Like, let's go, you know. And um, and so that, you know, that's just that's how life happens. That's how, that's how all this shit happened, you know, is is. You know, just be ready to go. You know, so that that started it in uh, 2014 on the on the motorboat cruise, and we went over to Portnoy's house a month later, made our first record, and made a second record, and you know, here we are, ten years later, <laughs> to have you know playing a playing a show with um, you know, it's the core four. It's me, Mengi, Portnoy, and Skolnick. We're the right. kind of the four captains of the ship. And then, um, and then, you know, a bunch of our friends, Phil Demo, Andreas Kisser, um, Troy from Mastodon, uh, John Bush from Armored Saint, Chuck Billy, of course, from Testament. So it's, it's a, it, it, Chris Poland is even joining us. Uh, and so, um, it'll be his first Metal Allegiant show. So, um, you know, we, we change it up. No two shows are the same. Yeah, that's at the House of Blues coming up on uh, January 25th. Uh, plus this year is the Nick Menza documentary dropping this year. You know, we set it to be finished uh, by the end of, you know, December 31st. And of course, it, you know, it isn't <laughs> as these things go, you know, there's a lot of, there's more people involved in this than me. I mean, look, they called me and said, Hey, would you want to narrate it? I'm sure. Well, next thing you know, I'm, you know, funding it a little bit and you know, I go with every freaking thing I get involved with, but you know, I do it like, you know, I have, a, I have a motto this year, you know, be led by your passions rather than be driven by your ambitions, mm -hmm. you know, and when you're led by your passions, you're always going down, I'd like to think the right path because you're, you're, you're excited about it, you know, and of course, look, Nick's my friend, you know, he was, uh, he was a dear friend to me as well as, 
you know, the the iconic drummer of Megadeth and all the other things that the fans know him as. He was a dear friend and his family have been very gracious to me as well. So, you know, for me to participate in that is is great. So that we're, we're going to do the premiere um, at, at my coffee booth, the Ellison coffee booth at NAM uh, next week. So um, we're and that's for anybody who's attending NAM and any of the media that's there. So we'll have a have a uh, well, you know, a, a, a screening of the premiere, which, you know, it's not that long, but it's it's a the short little clip. But it, it kind of summarizes the movie. It sort of takes you uh, through kind of the journey of what the movie's going to be. And my my hope is that we would probably premiere the film sometime this year. And, you know, I learned this after doing this with Drew, with Dwellers and stuff. You know, you you, you go around, you do the, um, you know, all these, you know, these, these um, festivals, you know, these film festivals and stuff, you know. So, um, and then, you know, you shop for distribution. And I mean, ultimately today, everything ends up on some digital platform. You know, if, if you're, if you're lucky, you get on Netflix and HBO and that kind of stuff. If you're, you know, uh, it, it, smaller independent stuff like this will probably end up on like, um, is it 2B and some of these kind of you know, digital platforms. So, you know, that those digital things in TV, that's kind of caught up to where the music business started with Napster, <laughs> you know, and Napster and iTunes. So, you know, it's like all music ends up digitally, all films now eventually end up digitally as well. You've probably talked about this, but since you brought it up, I never, I don't think I've ever asked you about this. Was Lars right? He was 100% right. And in oh. fact, we were told by our manager, shut up, don't say anything about it. It's too controversial, stay out of it. But I totally, I mean, on the sidelines, I'm going, he's totally right. You know, and like he said, he goes, look, you know, we have the money to fight this, da, da, da. Unfortunately, you know, it was an unwinnable thing. And, and you know, it, it was just such bad, you know, press, unfortunately, even though, look, He's right. You can't go to the grocery store and just decide to take a loaf of bread and go, you know, it's digital bread. It should be free. You know, and it's like, you know what I mean? Or if you're sitting at home on Amazon or whatever, you know, Uber Eats, it's like, yeah, you got to pay for it when it shows up at the door, you know? So, you know, there's no free lunches, you know, uh, no well, pun intended. Nowadays, but, nowadays, you can walk into stores and apparently steal stuff in some places. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 there are just certain places you can. Um, but, you know, no, he, he's right. It's like, look, you know, music costs people time, money. It's it's a it's an endeavor. It's I mean, look, if you just want to play for free and for fun, go go in your living room and play. Mm -hmm. But when you're out, you know, selling a product, which a song is when it's professionally you know, marketed, mm -hmm. um, then, yeah, look, there's 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 cost to these things. And for people to just take it is, you know, whatever. But and look, finally, it, a lot of it, I think, was just sort of educating people about how, you know, you, you know, the Internet can't just run amok with things as it tends to do with certain things things. Um, you know, for me, Steve Jobs, you know, he's my hero anyway. I'm an Apple guy, always have been. And, and you know, in a way, he kind of saved the day with that. And by, you know, creating the iTunes store, even if it was just so he could sell more iPods, you know, he created his own little music grocery store, you know, uh, to, to kind of, you know, create the ecosphere, I guess, you know. But um, so, you know, look, Lars was right. Steve Jobs got the job done and we all live happily ever after. Now, speaking of uh, of music and records, I uh, when I was found out I was talking, of course, I I googled your name just to see like what I could talk to you about. I mean, we could talk about a million things that people sure. probably wouldn't care about. But I yeah. saw the uh, I saw the five albums uh, that that you picked as as your five, and it's kind of funny because you got these uh, you got four albums from like the end of the seventies, early eighties, Destroyer, Van Halen, Unleash in the East, uh, Moving Pictures, and then you got Ghost. <laughs> So I thought that was kind of uh, I thought that was kind of a weird dichotomy, but I mean, of course, you know, we're we're about the same age, so that early, that late seventies, early eighties, kind of you know, transformed a lot of the music that we liked. You know, Jeff Young said it best. I was talking about Ghost one day, and he goes, "Dude, they sound like Bloister Cult." I went, "Man, that's it." If you're talking to someone our age, you know, what does this new band Ghost sound like? They've got this this kind of Bloister Cult, you know, this this. Of a vocal sound that's not this really heavy, rough death metal screamo kind of thing. Uh, you know, as Bloister Cult had a very kind of calming, soothing sound to the singing of, of Bloister Cult, mm -hmm. as well as these awesome harmonies. And, you know, there's, um, you know, like off Meliora, you know, he is, for instance, has these just beautiful guitar lines in it. You know, even the very final guitar line of it is it just reminds me of this very majestic, almost like Neil Schoen of Journey in the 70s um, 
sticks, you know, dual guitar kind of stuff. So to me, there's a lot of this kind of 70s classic rock thing in there. Of course, bringing the keyboard thing in, you know, I, I was not a big fan of keyboards growing up in in music because I always just want, you know, I liked Unleashed in the East, right? right? Heavy, just brutal guitars. And I've come to appreciate it a lot more, you know, and I've, I've played in jazz band, I've played in church, I've played in other, you know, uh, rock, uh, rock and roll fantasy camps, you know, where there's keyboards and things. And, you know, and it's interesting when you're in the room with a keyboard player, Al Petrelli taught me this actually, because one day I, I, I got a call to play in church and Al was in town, we were writing The World Needs a Hero. And I said, Al... In, in Al's tone, hey, not for nothing, you want to come play in church, you know? And then so he did, you know, he showed up with his tattoos and pack of cigarettes and, you know, but, but he, you know, Al's an educator, he's a Berkeley guy. He went to Berkeley the same year with the Dream Theater guys. And, um, and they all, I guess, did a year at Berkeley left and then, you know, started their bands and got on to being professionals. But, um, you know, Al taught me something. He says, he goes, you know, he didn't even have a chord chart. He goes, yeah, I'm just watching the keyboard player's left hand over there, you know, ah. to kind of read the chords. And I and so I learned a lot from him with that because, you know, whereas a guitar, you're looking at, you know, these 21, 22 or 24 frets, you know, which is, you know, one, you know, fret one to 12 is, you know, is the same you know, from here to 12 there, that's, that's, you know, one set of notes. And then it's just the same set of notes from 12 on up as many frets as you have. Whereas on a keyboard, you know, you're looking at, at just octaves after octaves after octaves. Right. And so visually, I think it's a little bit different. And, um, you know, so for me, when I hear the ghost stuff, it's, you know, it's, kind of Gary Weaver or, uh, you know, dream Weaver, Gary, Wright Kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's maybe at times a little deep purple, maybe a little angel. Uh, but then it's also got this kind of, um, seventies and, you know, 70, like the cars, like 70, you know, the cars had this really great keyboard sound, you know, it was very, really out there right and it sat it didn't blend in with the with the guitars you know so i i guess i've over the years and maybe ghost kind of opened my eyes to it a bit be or my ears to it because i i hear it now in a way that i think is very clever and cool and adds something and and look they made the keytar famous again <laughs> right? you know you know again greg, greg jeffrey from angel mm -hmm. uh gary wright you know they all had the keytar which is a keyboard that looks like a guitar you can come out and play it with a you know strapped on you know around your around your yeah. neck like the, the guy from revenge of the nerds <laughs> is that what it is i guess i think i think he had one of those two but uh yeah that's, that's funny you mentioned the song he is because that video was shot here in detroit and and the girl i work with jade is actually one of the girls in the video no kidding yeah. wow so you have a personal connection but I, but that's probably one of my favorite songs of theirs, and and they're great in concert. I saw those guys back in uh, August, and it was great because it was like a a dreary, cool, rainy night here in Detroit, and it's like that's the perfect way to see Ghost. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's got this this like this the the church thing is cool. You know, the whole the whole thing is you know, and it's interesting because the Europeans have a very different view of religion and church than we do here in America. You know, here we have this sort of religious freedom church and state literally you know the government can't be part of a church etc you know um and you know over there it's very different obviously the religious persecutions and stuff so they have a very not so favorable view of it you know so it's like when you see like nurgle with behemoth and you see you know the ghost stuff there's this this you know um uh, you know kind of shot in the face to that kind of that thing. And it, it, it's, it's a shtick, but it's, it's cool. You know, I, I, I like it. I think it's, I th I love it too. I saw it goes three times in the last tour and I thought it was just every time got better and better. I just thought it was fantastic. Yeah. Those guys are right on the money as well. What a, what a great band to see live. Yeah. Super good. You know, and it's fun. There's like nine guys on the stage. It's like earth, wind and fire back in the day. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's like this huge production and, uh, you know, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, I've been going to see a lot of shows when I just came home from Europe, we were doing the diet tour all summer and, and, um, it's just kind of chilling here in Arizona, just, you know, resting up and everything. And, and so I went out to see a bunch of shows. I mean, I would see everything from like Eric church to Ghost, you know, to Metallica, to, you know, everything, you know, Rob Zombie, Alice Cooper, all this stuff. And, you know, it's just fun sometimes to just go and be a, be a fan in the audience and, and enjoy watching a show, you know, just like I used to go see kiss at Iron Maiden and everybody when I was growing up in Minnesota, just, 
you know, and, and, you know, Kiss is one of those bands, you know, I, like I said before, I'll always be a student of Kiss, you know, even if they're not touring anymore, I'll still be a student of them. And, you know, I, it's, I, I go to concerts to be a fan. So I remember why I give concerts myself and to, and to really, and to appreciate my own fans, how they look at us. And, you know, when you're on that stage, it's a, it's a special sacred place to be. So when you're there, you know, be, be special, you know, give, give them their money's worth. Yeah, I had a pretty cool uh, kiss moment this year. They they played here in October at the uh, arena, and mm. uh, what happened was they do this kiss VIP thing that I think you were part of, where they play on the stage for the fans and the whole thing. I do that, yeah, yeah. Well, the stage here in Detroit wasn't ready, and so they actually put a they put a makeshift stage on the concourse right by where I was broadcasting. Whoa! Wow! Yeah, it was really cool. So they they played I think uh, five songs, you know, um, yeah. just sitting on bar stools. And it was really cool. Yeah, I uh, my friend of mine, Scott Revenald, who owns Asylum Records, he he bought the Paul Stanley Stage Smash guitar package. So he texted me, he goes, "Dude, you want to go see Kiss?" And I'd seen him over over in Europe this summer, and I was like, "Yeah, you know, why not? It it probably probably the last time I'll see him play live, you know, or at least on that level, you know." And um, and I say that because who knows if it's avatars or what they're going to do after this. But, um, you know, so and it was great. And he said, dude, come on down to the pit. And I mean, you're standing, you're leaning against the stage. I mean, he literally reached over and touched Gene's boot yeah, over here. Yeah, you know? yeah. I was texting my friend Greg Hanovit over in Minnesota going, dude, check this out. You know, imagine us at 13 when our, my mom took us to see Kiss on Rock and Roll Over. And this was all... You know, this was all like magic and showbiz. And, you know, now, you know, now I know how they do it. You know, I, I, I know how that's done. But still, again, it was just great to be there at the show. And and, and the sound check thing was was a great idea because obviously with Kiss, the shows with makeup, the sound check party was not. And then they would play different songs. They would play yeah. songs. And they're, as best I can tell, it's not a click track. It's like them really playing. And, and you know, so... Um, you know, there's all this, this stuff with that. And, and it, vocally it was on point. I mean, it was great, you know? So, um, you know, it was great to just see Kiss as a, as a stripped down, really awesome four piece rock and roll band, just like all the rest of us are, you know? That's right. That's right. At the, at the end of the day, for sure. Well, I'll tell you what, Dave, th- uh, David, thanks so much for uh, joining me. Uh, we've got the metal legions coming up on January 25th at the uh, house of blues. Uh, and of course, I'm sure we'll bump into you somewhere here in 2024. Of course, many, many more things happening. So uh, good to chat again. Thanks, Meltdown. Up next is Kevin Rosdale from Bush as the tour was announced, the loaded greatest hits tour. And that's with uh, Jerry Cantrell and the guys from Candlebox. If you're in the southeast Michigan area playing the Michigan Lottery Amphitheater coming up on August the 16th. Uh, But lots to talk to with uh, Gavin. Didn't have a whole lot of time uh, with him today. This was uh, just uh, on, uh, you know, by phone and stuff. Of course, we talked about uh, the passion of his dog uh, and didn't really talk a lot about music. Talked a lot about just cultural and family type things, which was, uh, I don't know, a little bit different as far as I'm concerned for talking with somebody like Gavin. But it was still pretty cool nonetheless. Check it out. It's Gavin Rosdale up next here on Talking Rock. Yeah, first of all, I just want to do uh, some of my condolences. I'm sure you, this isn't the first time you heard this saying the, the, your dog Chewy. You know, I met that little guy back in 2019, and I think I may have saw him again somewhere on one of the tours. If I'm not mistaken, did, did, did he wear a backstage pass every once in a while? Yeah, well, of course he had to get in. Right. <laughs> but yeah. I like to follow rules. You know, there are rules, you know. Uh, Chris, my guitar player, he doesn't like to wear a pass, but I sort of just figure this way easy wearing a pass because sometimes people, you know what I mean, they may not know you, and so instead of having a, like that conversation of like, no, no, I'm I'm playing tonight, uh, you're not playing anywhere without a pass, that kind of conversation, I just, I rock the pass, I give my dog the pass, so we just take it easy. That's hysterical. You know, it's funny because uh, the guys, uh, I, I remember like uh, Getty Lee and Alex and stuff, they, they would sell out arenas and they wear their passes. Yeah, I mean, they also some bands have this system where you they put their pass up on the side and it says these band members don't don't you know <laughs> harass them they right. get anywhere. I'm always like, brother, why make life so difficult? Why why is this nice lady from Alabama men and no you you come on now. <laughs> just 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 wear the pass? Who cares? But some people just like to not you know they like to rock the no pass look. I got you. Yeah, and, and Chewy, of course, a uh, fan favorite. And, of course, uh, the lady from Alabama didn't know who that dog was, so hence the pass. Yeah, probably more chance she knew him than she knew me. That's yeah. How That's how famous he was. Yeah. Who saw more shows, your, your your dog or your kids? 
My dog. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. You took her, you took him everywhere, eh? By a long shot. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> everywhere. Well, uh, you, anyway, good life. Yeah, a great life for sure. So you got this uh, loaded uh, greatest hits tour coming, of course, uh, here in Michigan, the Michigan Lottery Amphitheater on August 16th with uh, Jerry Cantrell and Candlebox. Now, I know you toured with Alice in Chains a couple years back, but uh, did you tour with these bands back in the day? Uh, not so much back in the day. I, I, you know, obviously loved them back in the day. You know, Alice in Chains was a massive band for me, as for everyone um, who loves uh, rock music. And um, and I played, I was on tour with Alice last summer, I think. Um, and, um, you know, it's just great to play with them. Jerry's an incredible musician. He's a legend. It's like a, a grand seal of approval, if you know what I mean. He's yeah. a, he's a, He's very discerning. He's not going to go and uh, uh, share his craft with anyone, any stage, anywhere. So that's kind of cool. Um, and um, we get to play some songs maybe together and stuff like that. And no doubt have some dinners together. And he's a bit of a gambler. So I could be in for a win-loss kind of summer. <laughs> uh, yeah, on the tables for sure. Uh, of course, you're at the yeah. Michigan Lottery Amphitheater. There's no gambling uh, there, but uh, there's some uh, close enough. <laughs> Good. But <laughs> good. He's too good. He's good. He's like a he's like a uh, Charles Dickens character, a shyster. You know, uh, it, it's funny when they're out on tour. Obviously, you're looking for things to do like that. But I have friends of mine on tour uh, that that tour and stuff, and and they become good at some of these games like AC Ducey and, and stuff like that. Is that kind of a common thing? Uh, you know, you just you you fill it with stuff. You know, you do things. Well, actually, that's not true. You start. I start with incredible intentions. I'm like, I'm like, I am definitely going to learn Spanish, finish Spanish on this tour, <laughs> and I brush up my typing. You know, we're English. We don't. We didn't grow up typing, so all English people are like terrible typists. So unless you, you know, because you don't learn it. So and all these things, but man, a couple of weeks in, you're just like a zombie, just going like day to day, just like just everything is about the show. Like I feel like a sloth, walk around in this kind of a semi like just just a cryogenic state, just waiting to like <laughs> fire up for the show, and then just to cool back down and just be like chill for a couple of, for a day or so. And I don't know what I really get done. I always also bring a pile of books that end up being like really sort of just that's the that, that's the effect of my. Uh, uh, working out is carrying my bag with too many books I'm not going to read around the place. <laughs> it becomes my workout. Yeah, because you know what I mean. The show, the show takes everything from you, and if you don't, if it doesn't take everything from you, it's not the right show. Right? Yeah, you haven't given it all. Yeah, you know it's funny because uh, this year on my Peloton, my goal is to do all my workouts in German. So I'm starting to learn the, I'm starting to learn the the numbers, the one, two, three, four, and that kind of thing. So maybe by the end of the year, I'll be speaking German. Who knows? Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. It's always something out there on tour, though, right? Because you get paid to travel. You get you you play for free, isn't that right? That's the way it goes. Yeah, and you spend the whole day going, "What am I doing with my life?" And then <laughs> in the nighttime, you go, "This is what I'm doing with my life. I got the best life." <laughs> that's so right. Like, it's all like seesaw, you know. Like that's why everyone on the road is so fragile because you, you like you, being in um. It's uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, pinball wheel on, on pinball machine. You know, you're just bouncing around and these great moments and all the lights flashing and then just before you know it, bang, you're down in a hole. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about it that way, but man, it makes sense. So, uh, so you were on you were on a Fallon or something the other night. Then you went on the Today Show as well, and I, and I thought it was kind of funny when you said you were learning how to throw a spiral so you're, you could play football with your kids. Yeah. So, are you watching? Oh, yeah. Are you watching the American uh, football playoffs? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I love it. I really enjoy, I really enjoy it, and uh, seeing it also through their eyes. And like, you know, as kids as they grow, they kind of want to watch more of it, and they kind of can sit through the kind of the bits where the timeouts and the kind of the set ups and all that stuff. So yeah, it's 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 great, and um, it feels a real part of our of our vibe with my kids, you know. And it's just you know, yeah, they're all into it. They're super into it. Super yeah. opinionated. I love it. <laughs> Americans, everyone, everyone, everyone knows. Everyone knows. I'm like, I just listen. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Everyone knows so much. It's brilliant. My band, they argue about it, talk about it. You know, they have the talk shows on. We got all the guys, all the uh, just the pundits. It's brilliant. It's just like nonstop. Everyone's like, let me tell you how it is. Everyone's like, let me tell you how it is. <laughs> no, I got it. Like, it's unbelievable. Everyone knows. Everyone knows. 
it's been terrible. Well, as far as your football is concerned, I, 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 I can't, I don't know, one of my friends played in the NHL, and he told me i got to watch this Beckham, and I just can't get through it. I don't know if you watch it on Netflix. Oh, which one? Which, uh, uh, Beckham. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally, totally watched that. Uh, you know, in fact, it was a great, that was like his greatest hits show because suddenly, you know, I mean, I think he's a, you know, I've known him a tiny bit, hung out with him a number of times, haven't seen him in a long time, but I, I knew him, our kids were friendly at one point uh, back a few years ago, and uh, he's great, sweetheart. And, uh, but even then, and I think he's a total sweetheart, I had forgotten when you put all his freaking plays together, his highlights reel, I mean, I remember him being fantastic, but at the same time, I'd forgotten how fantastic. And then when I saw that thing, I was like, you know, he, he was really good, that right foot. Because I was a big soccer player, so I have mad respect for him. So it's kind of like uh, with, with your band, with the greatest hits, you go back, you go, man, I knew, the, I knew Bush was good, but man, they are really good. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> well, like I said, Michigan Lottery Amphitheater coming up on uh, August 16th. And uh, once again, condolences and uh, safe travels. And uh, thanks so much for your time, Gavin. I can't wait to see you this summer. Thank you so much. We appreciate you very much. Thanks for your support for a long time. There you have it. Gavin Rosdale from Bush. David Ellison from You Name the Band <laughs> today on Talking Rock. Hey, thanks so much for checking out the uh, podcast. Uh, I have some uh, hooks in the water, as always. So make sure you uh, check back often. Uh, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. And thanks so much for listening to Talkin' Rock. Thank you for listening to Talkin' Rock with Meltdown. You can help this podcast grow by giving it a five-star rating and writing a review on Apple and iTunes. Plus, feel free to subscribe and share it with your friends. Until next time, thanks for listening to Talkin' Rock.